There's a race of beings on, upon the planet increasing in number, although visually and physically indistinguishable to most humans. They are the bringers of the new, the bringers of light. They're here to guide the awakening of terrestrial consciousness. Now, what I wanted to know was, where is the evidence? Because that sounds wonderful, and I do believe that this is what's going on. but we need to look at the evidence. She also talks about the fact that the DNA of the star kid has tenfold the amount of information. So we have to look at that and we have to say, well, where again is the evidence of that? Many, many of those that would see themselves as star kids or indigos, crystals, golden children, children of light, the metaphysical community has many names for these different types of um, children being born now. And they, I mean, even ordinary grandparents, if I speak to the Rotary or I'm t talking at a library, will say the grandparents will notice that their grandchildren are different somehow, even although they can't quantify it. So this is something that's been noticed in mainstream. I meet teachers that tell me the children are different now. So what is the evidence? First of all, what I have discovered is that it's global. And in the Himalayas, there's evidence of children there that show strange behavior. Children using unknown sign languages. Children who draw pictures of triangular objects flying in the sky. And that they communicate with telepathy with unseen ETs. So this is in the Himalayas. We have in Mexico similar kind of story. Mexican children that also manifest similar behavior. Many in the area reporting a long time UFO sightings, young children, extra agile, this is how the, um, it was written, and very talented. Their problem-solving skills have increased. They're much more disciplined, continually using strange sign language among themselves. And in Mexico City alone, a thousand children have been identified who are able to see with various parts of their bodies. And I actually saw on a DVD um, a young lady of 17 and not only could she, when she was blindfolded, actually describe with a hand, scanning the, the photograph, what was on the photograph, but when they put a newspaper under her feet, she could read the headlines through her shoes. So it seems like we've got abilities that we are only just tapping into. What's fascinating also in China, um, there's been discovered um, that a lot of children in China with similar abilities. And Paul Dong calls these um, China's super psychics. And they are also showing amazing psychic and intuitive abilities. They have the ability to open flower buds with thought alone, display telekinetic abilities, as well as other fascinating multidimensional skills, such as sensing others' thoughts. Being reported that the Chinese government has observed these children changing the human DNA molecule in a Petri dish before cameras and scientific equipment to record this supposedly impossible feat. There are many, many other things that they actually have um, been able to identify, and these children are now being fostered and being um, encouraged throughout China. So, what do the star kids themselves tell me? That not only do they have memories of being on spacecraft and being educated, they often have past life memories, including ones where they are not human. Information they have not consciously learned seems to be downloaded in many different ways, and I'm going to talk about the downloads in a minute. They have a sense of purpose, a sense of mission. They feel, excuse the pun, alienated on this planet. They find other human beings actually quite barbaric. And they'll say to me, I can't understand how we operate on this planet. It seems really, really primitive. And they are very intelligent and intuitively creative. According to Bashar, and to my understanding, and I do resonate with this, these indigo, crystal, star kids coming in, there's many possible scenarios of how they're becoming so light and bright and psychic. And one of the things that Bashar talks about is that the genetic material is actually modified by, in these abduction scenarios and they're kept. So they manipulate the egg or whatever's going on, they put it into the woman and she actually then has the kid with her husband 
and the mom, and then, you know, part extraterrestrial. So for me, and based on what I've talked to talked about with my dad and my mom and people around me, um, I think I have some genetic material that is part extraterrestrial more than um, most would. So back then, over the past hundred years or so, mm -hmm. um, there's been this abduction program, also mm -hmm. known as the hybridization program, okay. where these extraterrestrials are taking humans mm -hmm. and taking them up to the ship and then taking their genetic material, so their sperm or eggs, okay. and then yeah. creating children out of them. And of the, the people that are being taken, do they know anything about this, that their, you know, their DNA and their genetic material is being taken at the time? A lot of people, one of the things that they do is they have actually screen memories over, mm -hmm. like overlaid over their actual experiences so yeah. that they forget. But there's always kind of like a hint of it with dreams, okay. remnants, or they might have physical things that come up, like they feel pregnant or like their ovaries yeah. are aching or physical it's things. It's like a phantom pregnancy that's mirroring what's happening on a craft or right. spaceship sort of thing. So how, how did it start with you? How did it start with me? It started with me um, when I started doing a bunch of healing work. Okay. So I was doing, um, I was working with angels and ghosts and other yeah. lives and all the, these kind of things. And one of the things that kept coming up was this concept of abduction. Yeah. And then all of these um, abductees started coming to me and telling me their stories. And I'm like, this is real. Like mm. these people actually think that they were taken. And I was thinking that it wasn't me yeah. the whole time. And then finally, over time, like, it started, these memories started to come up for me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a mm. part of this. Of oh, course, wow. that's why it's coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, when did you think they start, take, start, when they took you, or your genetic material? Well, the, the biggest, like, memory unlocker was yeah. a regression that I did. Okay. Um, with Barbara Lamb, and she's one of the yeah. top ET regress, regressors okay. in the world, and, um, and all of my memories, like, just came flood flooding ba back yeah. from that. And so it started when I was about age three. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And what, why, do, uh, why particularly you? Why, you know, why not the person in the next house down the street? They take, well, it could be the person in the next house yeah, down without, the street. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It could be the whole street. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm running <right, right. laughs> yeah. um, They take genetic lines. Oh, okay. So they, they've taken my dad. They took yeah. my grandma. So they take certain genetic lines and yeah. lineages. Um, so they're always working usually in the families. Yeah. And but why do they choose these particular families? The the genetics, so um, the energetic structure of that certain family line, as well yeah. as the physical genetics that they're yeah. looking for, and also the soul contracts that these family lineages have to participate in this other way. A soul a soul contract. What is what? Explain. So <laughs> it sounds quite serious. sinister. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're three years old. They take you. So how, how did it progress from that to children? And could you talk about the, the child experience and all yeah. that stuff? Okay. So, so with my generation, because this kind of goes to the question you yeah. were just asking, my generation, it was a lot more positive. So there were, there were experiences on mm. these spaceships. They were like super exciting and fun, and I was always excited to go. Yeah. And it's similar with my generation, but yeah. the generations back... Um, these these greys they they didn't have the emotional capacity as humans do yeah. so they didn't know how to treat us oh. and so the, a lot of people had very terrifying experiences or that it was like physically hurtful in ways yeah. but then by the time they got to my generation and me it was a lot more exciting yeah. so in those first years after three years old I was um, I was I was on the ship just kind of exploring and getting used to it and I'd go up with my family, and I remember yeah. going up with them, so it was kind of like... So it was like, like a family outing. Right. Yeah, okay. Just spaceship, <laughs> spaceship for the night. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cool. 
<laughs> and then and then I was working with them to actually like design yeah. these children. Yeah. And by the time I became of age to actually like give eggs, then yeah. at that time I was like, okay, well I'm excited to yeah. give my eggs because yeah. I understand the whole thing and the program and everything. So yeah. so that's when it changed. So how how long does the you know when you give your eggs? How how long much later is a child produced? But how, how does that work? Is it in, in they got tanks or? Yeah. Yeah. How did you know that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm up there. Sometimes. I know. <laughs> Have you seen some tanks before? The, um. Anyway, moving on. Okay. <laughs> um. So, so how I am? I mean, it's one of these things that is so non-linear and yeah. so multidimensional that it's uh, it's hard to wrap my human brain around. Yeah. Um. Just even a few months ago, I was taking over here in Sedona. Yeah. And I saw a ship physically in the sky, and then a few a few minutes later my ovaries were hurting and oh. like aching and pain like I had yeah. just been in surgery yeah. so they can actually so they can take the eggs and then like you know artificially kind of yeah. inseminate and yeah. then put them back put them back in oh okay and they keep them a lot of the times in the human mothers on earth oh, so, so women yeah. will be like I'm pregnant but it is with their own child it's not like you know like Third switching yeah, yeah 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 um it's usually with their own child okay. but there could be other dna strands there could be multiple uh, people okay. in that yeah you, you got to see how people could find this quite cruel cruel yeah right yeah and until the other part the part that's so beautiful on the other end because a lot of the time people get caught up in the the cruelty or the yeah. that all of that energy but the kids like the kids yeah. are like the best, most light part of the whole thing. That's yeah. why they did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is for us to have these kids and yeah. for us to have um, this opportunity to like awaken to this lighter part of ourselves. Yeah. So what? So the, they're incubating the your baby upstairs, for want of a better word. And um, so, well, what was it like the first time you saw your child? And could you talk a bit about your child as well? The the first time I saw my child in this case, it, it was it was pretty sad because I was only like twelve or thirteen years old, yeah. and it was the first one that was created. Okay. And um, and I had they had stuck like this needle like this long into my hip oh, wow. to pull out hip tissue because yeah. the child wasn't forming correctly. Oh, okay. And so they were trying to like save this kid, and he ended up like dying because oh, in the beginning yeah. they they were just trying yeah. to figure out how to do yeah, this. Yeah. And it was. Abs- I mean, it was so sad. To, like yeah. it was like mourning the death of my yeah, of course, child. You, know, you know, yeah, yeah. So it was really sad. Oh, I'm sorry, but the, but in the but the other ones that I've met in dream time and remembering yeah. these experiences, it's just like it's like pure yeah. ecstasy. It's oh. so much fun, and it's so like, and it, it is so maternal. Like it, I mean, they're actually like on your breasts in on the oh, ship, okay. and it's just. So you motherhood. said you said how many have you got? I've, that you know of? I'm aware of probably 10 at this point. So, you, so you're a mother of 10 at 26? I'm a mother of 10 at 26. It's the Mormon heritage. Right, it must have been. <laughs> it must have been. So, like, do, forgive any of the facetiousness of the questions, but you know, like, do you get to, like, visit them and take them out playing, or do they live on the ship? How, how does it... How, can you talk us through that? They live, um, they live primarily on the ship, so... Um, have you ever heard of the Phoenix Lights in 1997? Yeah, 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 like yeah, right yeah, down the yeah. street from here, um, they so that was the huge mile-long mothership that came over Phoenix. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. those those are one of the hybrid civilizations that were created. So they not not only are creating these kids that are coming back to be with us on Earth, but they created five whole civilizations of very benevolent, loving beings. Oh. Okay, yeah. And that's one of them. So they're so the kids coming to Earth are on the ships. So they come down to Earth or do, do, do any of the kids visit you? Do you see what I mean like physically? Yeah. Here? Not they don't they haven't visited visited me physically here, but yeah. they visited a lot of the other people in the ET community okay. here. Like yeah. even one of our friends in Sedona like they actually like landed and the kid was in her living room. Oh, and wow. um, and Stan Romanek, who's public about this, yeah. he he is big in the UFO community, and he has had his children like come to some of his events yeah. physically. Oh, wow! So um, so they're starting to come, but the thing is, is they can't come in the present way our society is set up, like yeah. set up as like, okay, we're going to our job and our individual house and yeah. everything. Well, they probably get shot. They- they? 
That, that you agree? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bang, yeah. bye. Um, right. So what, what actually, what do they look like? Because I've, I've seen drawings, but you know, people listening to this or, or watching this ha- won't, won't know what they look like. So could you talk us through that? They're different, there's different um, kind of varieties of them, different yeah. generations of them. Yeah. But for the most part, they're children. So they could yeah. be like kids from like three all the way up to 18. Okay. And they're, um, they have slightly bigger eyes than humans. Yeah. Some of them, some of them look quite human. So yeah. people might have dreams about the kids and yeah. be like, oh, I'm just having dreams about kids. And it's like, no, they're actually the hybrids. Yeah. But, um, and then some have quite bigger eyes. Okay. And um, smaller lips slightly mm. bigger heads and then just like skinny yeah. little bodies so they just look like kind of odd cute looking humans yeah so um how many people because you said moms like how many people do you think is this is happening to if you had to guess well i've heard i've heard numbers from different channels material that it's a third of the world's population has oh, been wow. as a part of this is program this, yeah so yeah you never know. <laughs> but um and yeah. then <laughs> but as far as the ones that are really aware right now yeah. and the mothers that we're working with, um, I'm aware of like at least probably forty or fifty oh, moms wow. that I'm fr- yeah. like that that are aware, like working with their kids and dream time and talking to them and yeah. um but there's thousands. Because like well, what what is the plan for your children? You know, like you said the the what happens to them when they turn eighteen? Uh, and then how do they feel living on a spaceship? So they're kept they're kept out of time right okay. now. So so they are set to come to Earth when they're still children. Oh, okay. So they will better receive kids, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, adults. sure. Well, maybe not now after this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're more likely to accept <laughs> yeah. cute children than so, like adult aliens. Yeah, sure, sure. And our own <laughs> children, like they're yeah. our physical children. You know, people who didn't know they had children, it would be be a very nice surprise right yeah so, so yeah. and and a lot of time one of the things is that women can't when women can't reproduce it's because they've they're they're supposed to get it's like wake up you do have kids in this uh, other reality okay. so, so you, you've you been talking about um a community and there's a, there's a few of you are you planning to like gather the mothers together in parts of the world and stuff yeah yeah could yeah. you talk about that a bit so for the kids to be able to come here because they're super high vibration they're a different frequency yeah. than like than humans in general i mean they they just like teleport and they're like completely ecstatic and they know exactly who they are yeah. and they're super creative and imaginative and so for them to be existing on earth they can't exist in the way that we exist now mm-hmm. so it they can exist in the sacred sites that oh, are okay. super high frequency so yeah. we're here in sedona which is the highest frequency place in the northern hemisphere. It's the oh. huge vortex. Oh, okay. And places like Shasta and Maui and Glastonbury yeah. eventually. And these places that are super high frequency, so it's it's more alignment with theirs. Yeah. Somewhere where it's away from the collective energies of the cities, so we're gonna create our own sustainable structures that are in yeah. sacred geometry. And living together is like a unified whole, like so where everyone's living their passion and not kinda pooped out after work and like having to like get the money to pay the rent where everyone can like literally like just run free and like yeah. express themselves and so in this coming together and is is this new kind of like society or this new kind of like way of living then the kids it's more in alignment with them because mm. they work together yeah, yeah. but um, all right last question um have you ever been afraid when this has happened at any point yeah yeah just tell me about it um, I mean, in the beginning, like the con- the very concept of this whole thing is completely freaked me out. Mm. I mean, like, and I could feel the fear from so many people that have had negative experiences, which of course is just coming from through the filters of like, I want to be in control of my human life, and yeah. and something else that's outside of my control is scary. Just yeah. that alone is yeah. scary. But um, and then these these beings look different yeah, and yeah, strange yeah, yeah. um so i mean there was a time when uh zeta was in my room and then also this mantis like you know the praying mantis oh, they yeah. have like the tall mantises what, they're not doing themselves any favors are they like bringing these fellas along you know? no they're not <laughs> yeah so i was like terrified but i just knew that i had to get over this fear yeah um because it's just why have fear like why i mean i'm interacting with them so i yeah, can have not, love yeah they're not killing you or anything right yeah exactly they're but, assisting on yeah. a greater level
Jesse, when do you first recall being abducted? My first abduction occurred in 1957 when I was five years old in Rogersville, Tennessee, a very small town in Upper East Tennessee. My brother John was with me at the time. Uh, above the hill behind our house, we came up on the, what appeared to be a round house under construction. And one man, a taller looking figure, he had a rod, a long rod in his hand. A light was emitted from it and we were paralyzed. It is at this point that Jesse Long's conscious memory of what happened ends. He says it's only through hypnosis that he's been able to remember the rest of this first abduction. <laughs> what you are seeing is actual footage of Jesse undergoing hypnotic regression. being taken into the craft, taken into one room. I was placed on a very cold, flat table. My brother was separated and he was taken into another room. my legs I could feel them poking and prodding around my legs according to Jesse his abductors inserted a small item an alien implant into his left shin and it was in my body for 34 years could you feel it inside you what did it feel like it was always painful I always had to wear my socks below the incision point because it was painful. In 1991, Jesse had the foreign object removed from his leg. There it is. This is actual footage of that procedure. That's a good half inch long, isn't it? This is the object that was in my leg. And unfortunately, during the initial test that was done on it, it was broken into two pieces. But that allowed us to look at the inside. Some have dismissed the object as simply a shard of glass. But when it was analyzed at Southwest Research Institute, a materials analysis facility in Texas, the conclusion suggested a greater mystery. According to the lab's report, the object revealed a very remarkable composition and exhibited unique surface characteristics that cannot be explained and that the questions outnumber the answers. When the object was removed, I was convinced that whatever this object was had something to do with all of my abductions. Jesse Long believes he has experienced a number of abductions since that first incident in 1957 and they became more and more horrific as he grew into an adult. Most of my abductions occurred very similarly. When they brought me into the craft, they would take me down a long hallway. They would place me on a flat table. Of course, I was paralyzed and had to be because I was kicking and screaming. I didn't want to be there. Experiments on the table included a sperm extraction. The sperm extraction procedure is the most traumatic and has caused me the most problems in that they actually force me to crossbreed with what seems to be a female being. One, two, 
and those people tend to be the people who are boundary deficit disordered. They have problems with relationships. They always say, I've always felt like an outsider. I, I don't feel like I belong. They can't hold jobs. Uh, they just have a tough time in life. And telling this person who's been lost and outside and alone that they do belong, that they're an abductee, that they have an identity, and that there are other people just like them answers all of those questions for them. Jesse, when you tell people about your experiences, do they believe you? You know, it's not my job to convince anybody. It's my job just to tell you what I've experienced. If you believe it, fine. If you don't believe it, I don't care. This is evidence that can't be ignored. And the story just gets more and more disturbing. What Jesse says happened to him in 1990 may answer the question that hangs over every abduction account. Why is this being done? I was driving from California to New Orleans and right outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico on I-40. My car was lifted off the interstate up into a craft with me in the car. taken aboard the craft, placed on a table. I was presented with a baby, was told, this is your child. What happened then? And there were nine other children standing along the wall. They all looked at me, and I could see, yes, they were mine. Each of the children who were standing along the wall walked up to me lying on the table, and they each touched my hand as they walked by and looked me straight in the eyes. And they walked on out of the room. And the message I was getting from them was, we're okay, thank you. If you could confront your abductors, what would you say to them? If I could sit down with one of them right now and ask them one question, I would want to know why me and for what reason. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming forward with these cases, not only around the United States, but around the world as well. David Jacobs based his book, The Threat, on the explosive issue of hybrids, the crossbreeding of aliens with humans. For Jacobs, stories like Jesse Long's are only the beginning. I think we are looking at a catastrophic situation. I think we are looking at a disaster. We are seeing a unified program here with these beings. A program of physiological exploitation by one species of another. I don't know this sounds absolutely insane. We're looking at a colonization program in some way. Uh, Tom, tell me about the hybrid humans. This is one of the things that I didn't even expect would arrive in our study. There is academics who actually believe that there is a hybridity program that is going on right now. And this took me on a kind of a long journey that brought me back to one question, Sid, and that is why in ancient days when the giants, the first original hybrid humans, right, when right. they were created by fallen angels and, and were upon the earth, what was their mission, what was their program? It also had to do with hybridity and it also had to do with misleading and misguiding and even challenging uh, God himself. But notice that the oldest descriptions of those giants, how tall 
they were. 20 feet, 30 feet, they would be easy to pick up, right? There's a movie out there right now, Jack the Giant Slayer. Uh, and, and it's kind of based on that uh, mythos that exists in every culture around the world. They tell the story, the gods came down, the gods mingled themselves with humans. They took human genetics, animal genetics. They created a hybrid body. Now the question is, down through time, uh, you know, the Bible tells us there were giants in those days and also after that. So now we get past the flood and you have the Og, the king of Bashan. What is he, 12 feet tall? He's certainly not 20 or 30. And it looks to me like there was an intentional breeding down in size of, the, uh, of these hybrid humans until today they could possibly be walking among us and we might not even know uh, that we see them. There, is, there are academics who actually believe now that they are walking among us, that they're even in government. Now, that sounds astonishing. It sounds like a sci-fi movie, right? It does. In fact, why is Hollywood glamorizing all these things at the same time? Well, that's exactly right. So is that part of a setup? Are there occultists in Hollywood that have an agenda to try to help prepare humanity for what could be a, a kind of great deception? Uh, Genesis 6-9 uh, talks about Noah. Explain that. Our research led us to believe that something that happened in ancient days could be occurring um, even now as we speak. And when I say ancient days, I'm talking about the days of Noah, a time when all of the ancient records from around the world tell us that very powerful angels came down and they mingled with humans and with uh, animals. The best record is the Bible. The Nephilim is what he's talking about. Go ahead. Absolutely, the Nephilim. And it was a period of time in which only Noah, and therefore by extension his children, mm -hmm. were found, according to the Old Testament, perfect. When you study why the great flood came, the scripture makes it very clear that it happened because all flesh both man and beast had been corrupted. So something was happening in ancient days that had to do with the genetic degradation of God's creation. What does it mean when it says in the Torah about Noah that he was perfect? Yes, this is the Hebrew word temyem. Means uh, it's the same phrase that's used to describe an unblemished sacrificial lamb. It's talking about genetics. It's talking about the, his DNA had not been corrupted as evidently the rest of the world had been uh, by that time. So there was a saturation, an intermarriage between angels and humans, and then through intermarriage, this was spreading uh, over hundreds of years until finally, by the time we reach Noah, he's the last specimen left that has a genetic makeup, his DNA, as God had made it, and therefore you, you understand why God has to send this flood to wipe out all of this contaminated forms of life and sent this judgment in the days of Noah. Now, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah. Oh, yes. What, 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 tell, me, tell me this. In the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares, uh, the, the weeds, the wheat and the weeds, uh, the Messiah said, let them grow up together. Don't pull them out. I'm wondering if that's the difference between those whose DNA has not been corrupted and those whose DNA has been corrupted, perhaps through a hybridization process of these aliens. What do you think? You know, Sid, behind the scenes right now, this question uh, is unfolding among academics in a way that you can't even possibly imagine whether they're asking the question, do, have we concluded that hybrids are among us? And if hybrids are among us, can they even be saved? This is a complex question that's being raised by theologians right now. Isn't that an astonishing thing? That uh, what's even more astonishing to me is the Vatican secret plan for welcoming in an alien god with a small G. We'll be right back. It's supernatural. I, I, I'll tell you what. Very few Christians, Protestants, or Catholics understand what you're about ready to understand right now. But there are secret plans for welcoming. The Vatican will welcome in uh, this alien from another planet as God. Tell me about that. Well, Sid, you know, when you look at Bible prophecy and it talks about a one world government and a one world religion, mm -hmm. you know, you see how divided the world still is. And, you know, we have to think that something un unprecedented is going to occur that would unite the world under one heading like that. Now, Ronald Reagan gave a speech to the United Nations where 
He said, how quickly our differences would be resolved if we were faced with an alien threat from outside this world. I mean, this is in the 80s. He gave this speech in the UN. Now, if you look around the world, what people believe, I mean, statistics in the United States say around 50% of Americans already think that UFOs are aliens visiting the Earth. Now, there was a recent poll in the United Kingdom. More people believe in extraterrestrials in the UK than God, okay? And that's a, that's a fact. And so to me, the strong delusion is already here. The groundwork has been laid. And in our, our hypothesis at these powers and principalities that Paul writes about in Ephesians 6, these, these demonic forces have seeded this idea into the world. So we are primed and ready for a deception. Okay, but what, what makes you think the Vatican has planned to announce this? Well, you know, they're having astrobiology conferences. They, they've made it intellectually virtuous to believe in these extraterrestrials. Their writings coming out of their theologians have pretty much made the argument that if you don't believe in extraterrestrials, then that is actually the heresy. You talk about uh, that the Vatican is going to reevaluate their position on basic Christianity. What do you mean by that? Well, their theologians have written that they think that these entities will be evangelizing us, that they think the chances are that they're not fallen and we are, so that we would have to modify our beliefs according to their revelation. So are they talking about uh, setting up teams to evangelize humans and aliens? Is that what you're really talking about? Well, if you get on the Internet right now, you'll find... And baptize them? Hundreds of articles from the Vatican astronomers talking about baptizing extraterrestrials. A hundred years ago, our top wonderful theologians had predictions based on their study of Scripture. Tell me about Hawkins Pember that wrote about the days of Noah a hundred years ago. George Hawkins Pember was writing in the 19th century, and he found parallels between what he saw in the days of Noah and his age. And, you know, he, he pulled out seven parallels, and there were things like the church marrying itself to the world. Well, and, you know, and I went through Hawk, his list and then compared it to where we are now. Now, everything that he saw in the 19th century has just, you know, exponentially grown. I mean, you look at like the church married to the world. Now we have mainline denominations ordaining homosexual clergy and putting them up as their leadership. But they saw this a hundred years ago. He, it was coming. He did. And the seventh thing on his list was actually the appearance of these entities. And he called them from the prince of the power of the air which is what Paul calls Satan in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, the demonic realm in the New Testament worldview was the atmosphere above the earth. Now, tell me a couple other points that he saw. Well, Pember saw a vast population increase, for one. Now, our population has, has grown by leaps and bounds since something he couldn't even imagine. He saw a confusion of gender roles. Hmm. He was talking about it in the 19th century. Does that century. sound familiar to you? He sounds familiar to me. I don't think he would even have any, you know, inkling of how far that's gone now. I mean, now we have transsexuals, we have, you know, tr homosexual marriages. Uh, what did he say about holiness? He saw that there was uh, an emphasis on God um, being benevolent to the extent that they denied his holiness. Now, I think that we see this in this idea of pluralism, which is so popular in our culture where all religions point to the same God. Um, and this is a really acceptable notion in, in today's society, like to talk about hell or eternal punishment or the exclusivity of our Messiah, Yeshua, is the thing that most people don't tolerate. But you see, all these things the Bible says is black and white. They've got to be watered down for there to be a one world religion. I mean, what a setup. I want you to tell me the strongest thing in all of your research, and you've, you've done both of you, have done extensive research. I want each of you to tell me the strongest thing you found in your research. Well, as I'm listening right now to you and Chris talking, the strongest thing that's in my mind is what, the, again, what Vatican experts have told us when 
uh, Father uh, Malachi Martin was asked, why is the Vatican, why do they have a presence on Mount Graham? And one of the things we haven't had time to talk about is Mount Graham is sacred to the Apache. It is a stargate through which they, have for centuries, have seen creatures that come, that move back and forth. Now, this is right in Arizona. You're this is in Arizona. About. And, in fact, their creation mythos is that a disc came down and a bearded guy in the disc who was the father of creation uh, was what established Mount Graham as a holy mountain. Well, anyway, when Malachi Martin was asked, why is the Vatican on Mount Graham? What are they doing up there? He said that they're using their telescope to watch something. And when he was pressed on the question, he said it's because at the highest levels of the Vatican governance, they know what is approaching the earth, and it will be of the utmost importance in coming years. They're literally watching something with the Lucifer device that is approaching planet Earth. And what, what, are, what do you believe they're looking for? Uh, I think that they could be deceived. I think they're watching something and they think it's one thing and I think it's something else. And what was the last one? Um, where are you from? Oh, from Kansas. Kansas City. Kansas and, you, City. and you now live here in Los Angeles? Yes. Okay, brilliant. So, the hybrid children, talk me through it. How did you first discover? Um, so, several years ago, about three years ago, I came to LA and um, I had a private session with Bashar, mm -hmm. who is a channeled uh, extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. um, it was about an hour deep and I asked him about these experiences that I had had when I was like 16 um, and older that I mm. could remember when I was 16 uh, where I would have these ex like, like sleep paralysis in the middle of the night I would wake up and I couldn't really move mm -hmm. and I'd have somewhat of like a fearful experience mm -hmm. And then one night I remembered like thinking, oh my God, they're coming for me. Oh, wow. And I was like, well, that was an odd thing to think. So <laughs> yeah. I asked him about that. And then he, he was like, basically he said that it was um, abduction experiences with the Zetas, the mm -hmm. Grace. And then um, he went in, he actually just offered it up to me. He said that I had a hybrid child and yeah. she wanted to make contact with me. And um, he, her name is Pearl. Uh huh. Pearl. Who named her? She, she named her. Yeah. She, she named, named her. That's, that's her name. Yeah, yeah that's cool. her choice. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just like, I, I didn't even know what to say. So I didn't yeah. even ask anything more. I was just yeah. like, thank you. Yeah, and what does she look like? She looks like, she looks very human. Mm hmm. Um, she looks like me mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was her age. Okay. Like she was about nine years so she's, old. So she hasn't got many, like, alien characteristics? Well, no, not right. really. No. It's funny, like, she... I was really surprised by that. That was the yeah. first thing I said. I was like, wow, like, you're so cute and you look human. human. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You, yeah. Her eyes are just, like, slightly bigger. bigger. Oh, that sounds cool. And, and I just, I, we went back and forth actually. We were like, just slightly bigger. She's like, just slightly bigger. <laughs> and we're like, it's just like, it was so cute. So did any part of you think, well, I didn't ask to have this child. You know, they, they've kind of made this child from me and I, I didn't give my consent. Was there any kind of a bit of resentment or was it just happy that you'd had Pearl? And... Yeah, no, there was no resentment at all. Okay. Okay. Like I felt, utterly like just mystified mm -hmm. about the whole yeah uh, about the whole program but you knew something was wrong before you went to see Bashir Bashir Bashar yeah. Bashar you knew something was happening to you and and that kind of crystallized your fears if you see what I mean yeah I mean in a sense I I knew that I was having experiences uh -huh. in I what I would say is like a other another dimension mm -hmm. um 
Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't feel like, I felt like this, if anything, gave me more clarity mm -hmm. and more like um, beauty and awakening. And purpose, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. definitely purpose to yeah. it. So how did you get in contact with the other members of the, you know, like Bridget and how, how did that come about? Well, I met Bridget at a Bashar event okay. here in LA. He does them live. So, um, yeah, I saw her. She had mentioned that she was pulling yeah. together a community for the uh -huh. hybrid parents. Yeah. And I knew that I was a hybrid parent. And so I went up to her after it was over and just said, hey, this is my information. And then yeah. she and I clicked. Me and Bridget were, yeah. were super tight. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So why do you think they took you? I believe that they that I chose it I mm -hmm. believe that I chose it in, on another level like mm -hmm. before I came to live here yeah and um, I also think it's in my lineage yeah. with my mother mm -hmm. and who knows maybe even further back mm -hmm. from that but I do believe that it's something because my mom was also having similar experiences at mm -hmm. the same time that I was yeah so, so um, what does your dad think my father and I haven't talked about it. Okay. Would you, you like more hybrid children or do you think you're just going to have Pearl and that's going to be it? I have another hybrid. Well, I have... How I, many I, I, I know of three now. Oh, wow. Three so, hybrid children. So your mother at three at 27. Yeah. They're looking good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. Well, the, the Zetas, they know how to do it. Yeah. They know how to they keep my figure upgraded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how does it actually work? So they come and take some of your DNA or your eggs and then splice it together with someone else and then voila. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I I don't I've never had the experience of being pregnant and no. then like losing the child, yeah. which I know other detainees do. have had that yeah. experience. But um I don't think that they've ever done that with me. I think it's yeah. really just like genetic material, yeah, taking of my eggs. Cuz some people have had the experience of sex as well, haven't they? So with I other. have had that. Okay. Could you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Yeah. It was one of the most vivid memories that I've had um, on a ship. Uh -huh. But I was actually in a meeting with other humans, sort of like in a classroom setting. And uh, one of the Zeta Greys uh -huh. came to the front of the classroom, sat down, and there was a human sitting with them. And it started asking us questions telepathically. Uh -huh. And um, we all started answering, and then he opened it up for questions that we could ask him. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, I'm sitting next to this extraterrestrial being with green skin. Okay, what, like humanoid type? Humanoid. Yeah. Yeah. And, um,. I was just immediately like so sexually turned on by uh -huh. just like looking at this, this okay. being and I was very surprised but yeah. I felt all this love for him and automatically we're like making love on this bed in this classroom well, uh, in front of in front of everyone oh, okay so we're making you know yeah. so and I remember the Zeta like turning his attention to us and like what everyone was watching there were humans that were yeah. outraged oh, I can even, well, they were like this is not okay it was so funny I just like we but didn't you care. consented you, you know you, yeah. you, you were okay with it yeah yeah I was yeah. into it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where was it do you know where the the human the alien creature alien person was from yes I do actually yeah. he is a reptilian oh okay yeah so I, I, mean, I get a bit I can't follow it that easily, but so there's greys and reptilians, and the reptilians work for the greys or work alongside them or something like that. Is that they, yeah, yeah, they is work that? together. Okay. Yeah. They so work together. What, what? So would you? You know, like Bridget's trying to create a community. Would you? Would you go and live with other hybrid mothers? Is that the kind of the long-term plan? Yeah, that's definitely my plan. Yeah. Yeah. But do you think the children will ever come to earth? Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I think that the more action that I take personally because um, you know it's my in a sense like it's my reality mm -hmm. like this is sort of a dream reality too and the more action I take in the direction of living in the community and, mm -hmm. and being with other hybrid parents um, that I'll get to experience that yeah Suzanne Hansen is a very dear friend of mine who's had experiences all her life she's a former teacher she now runs You Focus New Zealand, 
and has had many conscious experiences. She's been taken aboard craft many, many times. She's also been shown her children on the craft. And she's going to confront some of you that perhaps still feel that a lot of the Zetas and Greys are in fact robotic-like creatures because that's not been her experience. And it's not been the experience of many of my clients. Now, this is a particularly fascinating um, experience that Suzanne had. She was told to come and see me and have a regression. She flew over from New Zealand to Perth. Not exactly cheap, but she was told that this was one. She shouldn't have any I um, come in with any mandate, any particular experience. She had to be open to what we explored. So this was totally, um, in any way, an, uh, uh, not a conscious um, experience. But I want to demonstrate something very, I believe, very profound. My name is Suzanne Hansen, and I'm the director of a New Zealand UFO sighting and contact research network called UFOCUS NZ. I have experienced contact with extraterrestrial species since early childhood. Today I will describe two directly related experiences on board craft which demonstrate how some souls are altered, educated and fostered by ET species as a part of ongoing constructive programs and agendas for the future benefit of mankind. In 1962 when I was eight years old I was taken on board a craft and into a large familiar room that I had visited often with other human children. Here we learn to interact and socialise comfortably and competently with other species of ET children using enhanced telepathy and sentiency. On this occasion I was taken aside by an adult grey and asked if I'd like to meet another child somewhere on board the craft. Before I go any further I just want you to be aware of the little cradle that you're seeing in this picture. And that particular cradle, when Suzanne first saw it, she burst into tears. And she says, I know that cradle. And she described the fact that when she'd had, and she had a very difficult childhood, that when she'd had a particularly traumatic time on Earth with her human family, she was put on that cradle. And it actually had certain frequencies that would re rebalance her energy field. And she burst into tears because she had been shown such compassion and such love. The Grey telepathically conveyed thoughts, pictures and explanations to me regarding this child and its life. But the volume of information was too great to retain consciously and I was just left with an overall impression regarding meeting a new friend. The Grey told me about the child with considerable care and I sensed there was something he was not yet telling me, but he was seeking my cooperation with this meeting. We proceeded to a small room and waited and I felt excited about meeting a new friend. Two greys entered the room with a vibrant blue ball of light floating in the air between them. As I stared at the ball in surprise, having expected a child to arrive, I experienced profound feelings of love and familiarity and sobbed at these unexpected thoughts. The grey told me I would love this ball of light in the future as it would become my son. He referred to it as both a source and a complex system, and said I had known it since before my own birth. The Grey began an intense mind-to-mind -mind download consisting of three streams of information. The first just calmed to my emotions and confusion. They wanted us to get to know each other, future mother and son, and they would observe how we related to each other. A second stream embedded extensive information into my subconscious concerning the purpose of this project the genetics involved in the creation of my son's body, and the dual education he would receive on board craft, both as a child and in his source or soul state, which he told me had been enhanced and altered by them for a specific purpose. Finally, a third stream brought my mind back to the present as an eight-year-old child, and they left me to play with the ball for a while. I tried to relate to the ball by first asking it to bounce, but it just floated there, unresponsive. I felt disappointed and sat down on the floor. Suddenly, I felt as if I was being watched and became aware the ball was thinking at me. It descended down onto my shoulder and we were soon racing around the room, communicating happily. But all too soon, the greys returned. They expressed satisfaction that the meeting had gone well. Two of them took the ball of light away and I felt deep sadness and longing. 
The Grey assured me that we would meet again many times up until the day that this son would be born. So we returned to where the other children were interacting. In 1983, now aged 28 years old and near to full term in my first pregnancy, I was taken on board craft. My memory begins with me being assisted down a corridor by two tall entities, a mixture of species. They expressed concern for me as I had been ill throughout the pregnancy, and so they tenderly supported me as we entered a small room. They helped me onto a shelf-like bed, and we were joined by a grey. He explained that they were bringing someone to merge with me, and I was not to be concerned as everything would be fine. Holding his hand over my forehead, he told me he first needed to retrieve some memories from my subconscious mind, which had been embedded there in childhood. Immediately, my mind was filled with images, emotions, and memories of past meetings associated with a ball of blue light, and I became really tearful as I realised it was the soul of my child soon to be born. As he calmed my emotions, a group of ET children came into the room, bringing with them the now familiar soul or ball of energy. He stated these young entities had grown up on board craft with this soul and they would play an integral part in supporting him in his life. There was a real air of excitement as the process of merging began. The grey slowed my metabolism right down to prepare my body for the intense energy of the soul, necessary to prevent shock to my body. During the hypnotic regression with Mary, my voice became really slow and almost indistinguishable at this point, and my body felt cold and numb. Slowly the soul entered my body and the body of my child-to-be. I felt infused with light and weightlessness as the grey slowly brought my metabolism back to normal again. He stated my son would be born late, which he was, and that he would be accompanied through his life by watchers, a terminology to describe a protective system they would provide for him. He added there are thousands of children being born in a world like him, part of an extensive project to create positive changes and accelerated evolution from within the human species. These two experiences illustrate the complexity of the soul state and reveal extraterrestrial involvement with souls incarnating on this planet for specific purposes, but can also be enhanced, altered and educated by external forces or species. Now this is going to, for some of you, I think, be quite a difficult concept, um, and I understand that. But what it seems to be and suggesting to me, and obviously um, Richard Dolan talked about it yesterday, that we are not just perhaps looking at the fact that we're um, looking at extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, transcendentals, and perhaps even some from our own future. But the bottom line seems to be, as this 15-year-old that was seeing Uncle Ted and Grandad as orbs of light, that they are also part of this big picture of these beings that we are interacting with or having encounters with. And there seems to be far more going on than we ever thought. And there is that, the sense that there is no actual separation in that sense. I think for the one thing I want to say now is that the abduction, the so-called abduction scenario, I participated in a thesis by Simon Harvey Wilson that was the comparisons between shamanism and abductions in Western Australia in 2000. And what Simon discovered was the parallels were quite fascinating in terms of transformation, healing, etc., etc. And my sense is that what we're seeing is a modern day shamanic experience where we are being challenged to transcend our fears, to be prepared for our multidimensional nature. Now, you can take that or leave it as you will, but it seems to me that if they've bothered to change and alter our genetics and gradually enhance our abilities in the way that they're doing so that we can become multidimensional, why would they bother if it wasn't um, an, an agenda which seems to me to suggest we are being helped to change and to grow and to understand our multidimensional and the magnificent nature of what we could be because I believe we all have the potential for that and perhaps just perhaps they're giving us a helping hand and I believe from what I've seen so far anyway that, that that's the case Let's come together
Change the world.